Tonight I'm gonna, I want to, I want to, my, my desire is to take you into um, literal Babylon, uh, Revelation chapter 18. Um, I, I did spend the last meeting kind of giving a, a, a bit of an overview, a little bit about Revelation chapter 17, which is Mystery Babylon. And um, Mystery Babylon is the harlot. Okay, it's a nice way of referring to a whore. And whoredoms, whoredoms, uh, you must understand, scriptural whoredoms is idolatry, okay? And, it, and somebody, today, one of the big moves, uh, you know, every generation's got their belief about who the, who the harlot is of Revelation chapter 17. Oh, it's from a Catholic church. Oh, it's this one. Oh, it's that one. Different ones about the Antichrist. Oh, it was Hitler. Now it's, uh, you know, some new guy, you know. Um, the, the whore, the whore, oh, I saw Obama. Actually, I had horns on Obama today. He's the Antichrist, you know. This, whoever you're not liking the most, that's the Antichrist. And then you're going to be, <laughs> yeah, then somebody's identified him. He's definitely Jewish and, uh, you know, but uh, it goes on and on. But at any rate, uh, now the big thing is that the whore is Islam. And there was a time that I thought that I considered that, that, that the whore was Islam. And if, if it wasn't Islam, it was going to be a part of the eighth kingdom. I don't believe that anymore because the Lord showed me it was far more sinister that. And he showed me and he made real to me um, the reality of uh, the idolatrous uh, power that ultimately angels and demons gave uh, in revelation to men, if you would, by having a, an idol of stone as a mediator between them and men. So that, you know, all of a sudden if you're <laughs> suddenly praying to this idol and something supernatural happens and you're going to attribute uh, this ability to have these supernatural results to this idol. And so it's really, it was, uh, you know, the angelic deception and demonic deception, deception that brought about idol worship. And ultimately idols were um, related to deities, a deity like um, Apollo and uh, uh uh, a, demi, a demigod, what we would call a demigod or a deity, an idol, one that uh, people would refer to as a god, loosely defined. And then, of course, we see Apollo or Apollyon come up out of the pit. And we know that those angels that are bound in the pit right now are those who committed acts of fornication with the daughters of men and left their first estate. And the result of that cohabitation was giants in the earth that we read about. Not only with David, who did David kill? He was a giant. Not only um, Og, king of Bashan, who was one of the giants. And um, other places, the, you, you hear, you read about the valley of the giants um, in Numbers. And, uh, and so, um, but also uh, that, that which we read about in Genesis chapter 6. And... Um, so when we look at Mystery Babylon in Revelation chapter 17, what we see in Mystery Babylon is several clues that's very important for us to grab a hold of in understanding end time prophecy. And we don't want to forsake the, 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 the importance of these clues. And one of the most important clues there is the word Babylon itself. Okay? And so, why go to Rome to find Babylon, okay? Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense, okay? Babylon is right where it's always been. And this guy named Nimrod uh, is the one that we read about in, in, in Genesis chapter 11, also in Genesis chapter 12. He's the one who founded Babylon. He's the one who created Babylon. He's the first Antichrist model that we really clearly distinctive Antichrist model that we have in the Bible. Um, he was a hunter of men. He hunted men to uh, ultimately bring all men together under his rule. So all, all the world would be united under his rule. And so I'm not going to go and revisit all of those things that I have told you. That you can go back 
and uh, review the YouTubes. Praise God for people that are doing that. Um, just to give you enough to just kind of bring you to this point, to just kind of connect the dots here of, of that first big event and ultimately that almost final event, the seventh kingdom uh, that is symbolized by this whore, Mystery Babylon, in Revelation chapter 17. And then, of course, another big link is, is that image right there that's, that's on this Daniel 70th week chart down there at the bottom. Once again, that revelation was given in Babylon. And, you know, uh, I'll back up and regress for just a moment and say that, you know, when we think about Babylon and we think about Assyria, there's not a whole lot of difference, okay? Um, because the Babylonians and the Assyrians are constantly trading, uh, you know, land grab and, and basically switching the dominance and power and basically find themselves in the same geographical region when it comes to their capitals. Got to watch the sand. I don't want to put my eye out with a laser. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I'm... I, 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 I really want to emphasize this, this, this important point because when we get then to Revelation chapter 18, now we've gone from mystery Babylon, something that will tell us that uh, is uh, this power that has always been working, that is connected all the way back to the beginning. Because remember, she's riding a beast that has seven heads that represent seven kingdoms. And we go back and we understand what those kingdoms are. We look at... We look at um, the first kingdom it, it being Egypt that oppressed Israel. Because it's always in the context of these Gentiles oppressing God's people, trying to stop what God has purposed to do. Okay, that's really what it, from the very beginning, it's always about how can we stop uh, the possibility of a Savior coming and redeeming men. And how do we stop the possibility of redemption that would impact, it, really, the whole of the heavens? The whole of the universe. He cleansed the, the heavens with his own blood. Think of, just think about that with me just a little bit. Pretty radical stuff. And that's really, by and large, why angels came in and tried to subvert the human popula population by their terrible defilement of humanity so that there would be no hope that there could come forth a Messiah through a descendant of Adam. And uh, so over and again, we see this attack against the, the, the line of Adam traced all the way to the moment in time that God brought forth through Adam, the Redeemer, the Messiah, Christ Jesus. And of course, when we trace that back, we use Abraham as the, the keynote figure. But over and again, there was these attacks to try to destroy the possibility of God's Savior coming into the world. So, Mystery Babylon is connected with Egypt. And of course, when, when, when we start with Egypt, I, I always like to look back first to foremost to Nimrod and look back at the, he's the first one to build a kingdom. He's the first one to bring men together. He started this, this ziggurat, uh, this temple worship that would interact with the uh, the, the demonic world, which then you can see uh, uh, taking place in, in, in Egypt. And of course, Egypt became known more for its witchcraft and sorcery. It, who was there to stop um, Moses? The, the sorcerers, um, the, the soothsayers, the uh, witchcraft, sorcery, those kinds of uh, particular phrases for demonic activity are first used in association with Egypt. That's something that we see transferred from Nimrod's kingdom. And then the, but, but the first, but Nimrod wasn't interfacing with Israel, was he? He wasn't. That's why he's not mentioned. He wasn't, because Israel wasn't around yet, right? <laughs> Abraham came, came after Nimrod, and God found a man who would walk with them, and it, it was for one purpose. He got a man that he can bring forth the Savior through. That's, all, that's, who, that's what it's all about. That's why Paul said he didn't say seeds, which are many, 
when he was making his promises to Abraham, Galatians, he said, seed, which is one, speaking of the Savior. Father found a guy, a man, who would walk with him in such a way that he would ultimately be able, through the influence of Abraham, to have a people consecrated so he would have a virtuous woman named Mary who worshipped him and him alone. Are you with me? Who would observe the ways of righteousness and the ways of heaven and not be involved in demonic power so that he would have a vessel by which he could bring forth the holy seed, a holy embryo. A vessel by which the Holy Ghost would come upon, a vessel yielded to the Holy Ghost, a vessel trained up and mentored under the law enough to be able to yield to the Holy Ghost and receive the word of heaven. She had to be able to say, be it unto me according to thy word, because God's not going to force anybody's will. When you think about it. That's what he found in Abraham. And so out of Abraham comes these children that we call Israel. Because that's the name that God gave to Jacob, one who wrestles with the Most High, one who wrestles with God, one who contends uh, with God for the blessing. That's what the name Israel means. And Israel goes down into this kingdom, Egypt. And this kingdom, Egypt, is not about Islam. It's not about Roman Catholicism. It's not about any other ism. It is about its idolatry. It's about the, the, the God King deity. Just a, 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 a concept that we see espoused in Nimrod and his interaction with angels and his interaction with demon powers, as I've said, all the concepts of genies, all the concepts of the winged creatures all come out of the Bab ancient Babylonian, ancient Assyrian empires. Okay, just really wanting to emphasize their intimacy, their interaction with uh, the demonic realm with the, the, the angels of darkness, which did they not, they've not died. <laughs> they didn't go away. They still here. They modified. They still just as much a part of society. They still just as influential within the cultures and kingdoms of men as they've ever been. They still involved in the money system. They still involved in the social system. They still involved in the governmental system as much as they've ever been. People just walking around blinded, blinded, only because of their love for their own life and their love for the things of this world. My goodness, you give yourself over to the King of Kings and your eyes are open and suddenly you see what really is taking place. So suddenly you begin to understand and comprehend the sinister plot of Satan to uh, try to overthrow God and purposefully overthrow every human being. So, back to the point of why we look at Egypt as that first kingdom of the seven kingdoms that the seven-headed beast uh, that the mystery Babylon right, uh, rides upon is because it's really all about Israel. It's all about God's people that he separated to bring forth the Messiah and his promises specifically to a family. And God's still got his promise to a family. And God's got promises to the families of the earth, different families, different tribes, different nations, and a lot of verses of Scripture on that. But a special promise to Abraham. And they go down into Egypt. They were oppressed in Egypt under the idolatrous system of pharaonic worship where they worshipped a, 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 king, a, a king that believed that he was a god. And um, then the second one being uh, then the Assyrian Empire that oppressed Israel. And oppressed Israel because of their disobedience, God gave them over. You talk about getting, being given over to a reprobate mind. You talk about God divorcing you. God will divorce. There is one justifiable reason above all other reasons for divorce. It is defiant rebellion. Okay? It's defiant rebellion. He said, oh, divorce is terrible. Yeah, it is. Rebellion's worse. And so ultimately God gave them a writing, handwriting of divorce. He divorced them, gave them over, chastised them, and scattered them throughout the earth to the Assyrian Empire. That's the second oppressor. Once again, an idolatrous uh, kingdom which worshipped a god king, which had all kinds of idols associated with every kind of deity that you could name that would still uh, have names that would be familiar to people today, like Zeus, and as I said, as Apollo, other, other uh, names. 
But then the third one being Babylon. And then it was during, and, and then the fourth being, of course, I'll just run through the list and then come back to this. The fourth then, uh, then being, um, after that, Media, Persia, then Greece being uh, after that, and then Rome. And then now we've been in, in an interim period. Rome was the last nation to oppress, last kingdom power to oppress Israel. Somebody said, well, Israel's been scattered and been oppressed for 2,000 years. But yeah, but they've not been on the scale that you would see where they were oppressed in, in Egypt under a, a, a world-dominating kingdom power. So uh, they would have to be, um, you know, it, it, that cannot be fulfilled. They, they cannot begin to be oppressed again like they were with Egypt, with Syria, with Babylon, with Media Persia, with Greece, with Rome, until the rise of the seventh, Rome being the sixth, okay? And so here's this woman, she, this woman, Mystery Babylon. Well, what is she? She's the, she's the whore. She's drunk on the blood of the saints. Who? On the blood of who? Saints. What saints? Israel saints. Israeli saints. Israeli saints in Egypt. Israeli saints, are you with me? God's saints in Assyria. God's saints in Babylon. God's saints in Media Persia. God's saints in Greece. There were no Christians in that day. Hello. We got to quit, quit swapping things around, taking things out of context, because that's confusing. I've never, have you ever noticed how confusing it is when you take something out of context and misapply it? Huh? To another, it just, you know, nobody knows what's going on now. Okay, so we're talking about the saints that have been oppressed by you. Blood. So people say, well, she's drunk on the blood of the saints. Ah, that's the Christians. No. Because there were no, you just got to apply to all seven heads. I said it's got to apply to all seven heads. And that it only can apply to Israel. And that's what, that is what Daniel's vision is all about. It concerns God's people, Israel. And just, hold, I want to come back to this chart, but I want you to go. I want you to go quickly to uh, the chart. Uh, flip through the chart so I can tell you. Not that one. Uh, that, go back to the other one. That's really a good one. But, and I really like, go to the, you can't really see this one though. Go to the next one. I really like, I really like Larkin's, how Larkin depicts this, okay? Because here he's got the prophet and the prophet's standing there, and he can see the mountain peaks. He doesn't see the valley of the church, really. And if you go back, go back, go back to the one before this. Now, that's the one after it. Can you go back to the one before it without having to rewrite your computer program? Okay. One of the things I love about Larkin's seven great, the seven great crises is he's always showing the valleys in between the big peaks, you know. And there he's got the church over there again in the valley between the cross and then the, the, the second advent of the Lord Jesus, the second coming of the Lord Jesus right there. But if you've never been, if, now go back to the chart we were on. If you've never been acquainted with, with Larkin's charts, Clarence Larkin is one of my uh, champions and heroes of the past. He... He was able to take all prophecy in the Bible and put a chart for him. He did it far, He did it long before Dave did. I think he was the first that ever did it, put the Bible in chart form. It's, it, and just, it is, it's amazing studying uh, Larkin's writings, studying his charts. If you've never done that, it's easy to access. You just go to www.larkin. <laughs> it's pretty easy. Or just, you can actually be looking at these. And I see some of you got them right there on your um, smartphones and apps right now. Because you just went to the Larkin website, and you're, you're getting a good view of that. So on the web, if you're watching on the web right now, you could just go ahead and you could just uh, type in Google, Daniel 70 Weeks Larkin, and you'd be right there. It'd come right up for you. Pretty cool, isn't it? I love the way that works. I mean, my goodness. The access that we have with uh, the Internet, if it's kept, uh, in a way that is pure and holy, in the way that all God's people should treat it anyways. My, wow, the access that we have to things. But, you know, I want to talk, talk about Babylon. I want to talk about literal Babylon for you, and I'm trying to get to it. I'm, I'm, I'm having to get to it by refreshing you on these things, and, and I'm going to encourage you 
to go back and revisit uh, the YouTubes that we've already done so that you can become, you know, well-versed in these uh, points that we brought up, that you can really understand the scripture that is associated with these points. And um, what's going to happen, then you're going to be really ready to listen to me on my last big uh, revelation study that's coming up the next time, and which is going to be in January. I'm going to bring this thing to a crescendo that is ultimately, it is the point that it should, that all prophetic teaching, and not pathetic teaching, but prophetic <laughs> teaching should bring everybody to. And I'm just going to uh, leave you in suspense about the title of it. But, uh, you know, I really, you know, want to impact you with the reality of what this is all about in uh, these important timelines and um, chronological uh, descriptions that we have in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and certain events that really allow us as a peg in the ground to navigate. Because when you look at Daniel's, the vision and the revelation that Daniel had concerning 70 weeks. And he's not talking about 70 weeks upon the world. He's talking about 70 weeks upon the nation of Israel. When you look at these various different symbolisms in the Bible, he's not talking about the whole wide world. He's not talking about the Christian community. That, once again, Larkin's description is very great. And, 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 and well, it's just perfect in that he puts it in a valley, which is like it couldn't be seen really. It's pretty much hidden no one really realized it. No one realized that there would be 2,000 years between the 69th week and the 70th week of Daniel's vision. Because Daniel's vision is all about God's dealings with this people that he raised up through this man named Abraham. And now there's this descendant of Abraham named Daniel. And Daniel's praying and he's saying, Lord, when will you cause us to go back? to the inheritance that you gave to Abraham our father and that you established this in when you brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And he's crying out to God, what is it going to take for us to step back in our inheritance and be liberated out of this captivity? And in this context, the Lord says, let me show you about my plan for you guys. Are you with me? Let me show you about my plan for the family of Abraham. Let me show you about my plan for the people of Israel. And then he shows them 70 weeks. And um, so in, in, in that 70 weeks, ultimately, we also have the vision that he gave him of the kingdoms of the earth that would exist from the day which he lived in represented by the head. And then I'm going to say this. I'm looking for someone who's a good artist to help me redo these charts. I, I need to redo Larkin's charts. I, there's a number of things I want to change about them. But one thing is, no, this looks like a genie to me. And no one has ever done uh, the image of the giant uh, as regal as it should be done. And so we're going to try to make some improvements on that. So... Any, you just, artists, you can talk around uh, the community about it, and whoever feels like got the best skill set, let me know. Because we just got to do this thing right. But in the context of what God is, sh is showing uh, Daniel about what is going to happen with the nation of Israel, he also shows him all the kingdoms that are going to exist upon the earth just before he returns and comes, uh, comes back. And let me, let me just go to, the, go to the next chart. The next chart extends his feet out, and then I'll come back to this. See this? I love this. See how he extended out his toes? He extended out his toes all the way through seven years. That's seven years of length of toes until he shows the Lord coming down with his church. Uh, hallelujah. Right out of heaven to, to ultimately... As a stone cast down out of heaven that strikes the earth and forms into an exceeding high mountain. He doesn't really show up very well here. Show me the next part. See if next chart. See if I've actually got that chart. Next one. Uh, don't go too quickly. Yeah. 
And this is this, does he show it here? Um, not really, does it really show it there? Go, go back to the chart. I, I, this is just some improvements. I guess I was imagining that they just haven't been implemented yet. Give me, give me another year and, and we'll, we'll show that. The, the important event that all of this culminates in is the return of Christ Jesus with all the resurrected saints. It's not, include, it's not just the church. It's all resurrected saints beginning with Abel. All the way back to the beginning. Hallelujah. That's the bride of Christ. Somebody said, well, the bride of Christ is the church. The bride of Christ is just part of the church. You can't leave Abraham out of the bride of Christ. Huh? And so... Um, in the vision that God gave to Daniel, it repre he represented Jesus being as a rock, as a stone that is cast down out of heaven, that is thrown out of heaven by the Father to destroy the rock like a, put it, put it this way, like the rock that came out of David's sling that hit the giant in the head. Are you with me? And he fell down dead. <laughs> the Lord's got a sling, and he's got a rock named Jesus, and he's going he's to sling that down, not at the head, but at the feet, and he's going to hit the feet so hard, it's going to destroy the whole of the kingdoms of men. And they're going to ultimately crumble, but the shock of the rock is going to be so impactive that the whole of the beast is going to crumble to dust. Then the Holy Ghost wind of heaven is going to blow, and it's going to scatter the dust to a place where it can never be remembered ever again. And then that rock that came out of Papa's sling is going to grow into an exceeding high mountain and fill all the earth speaking of the rule and reign of Jesus and the government of God growing and spreading and taking over the whole of the earth until he has brought all power into subjection and submission to the Father. Then Father's going to be accepted and, be, and he's, then he's going to come down and be all in all. And that's what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24. And that's what I'm living for. Amen. Hallelujah. And so I'm about to get it so excited, I'm just going to forget about teaching and run around for a while. Shout. Ah! <laughs> Hallelujah. Because the reality of it, these things are, are is the in my, they're in my spirit. They're in my soul. They're in my being. I, Father, I've been born to the Word. <laughs> and the Word is alive on the inside of me. And so everything inside of me is bearing witness with God's Spirit and with His Word. Because I've been born to Him, hooked up with Him, got the same heart and attitude about stuff. And so he starts talking about it. He gets excited. Just wait till I get rid of all this mess. Wait till I clean up the garbage around here. Wait till we get this place fixed up. I'm telling you, man, you should see my remodeling plan. And millennial reign is really a remodeling. Yeah, somebody said, can I, be on the, can I be on the demolition squad during the millennial reign? It is a serious remodeling plan. But then after the thousand years, Father's going to do recreation, make a new heaven and new earth. Hallelujah. He's going to wipe it all out with fire. He's going to, everything that is alive can stand in the fire at that point point. just be, you know, just fine. Hallelujah. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and then, and then, my goodness, why, we cannot even begin to imagine the glory, the wonders, the beauty of life. You think you think you live in now. You think you got some plans now. You think you saw something beautiful now. You think you got a vision for the future now. Wait till you see the new heaven and the new earth. Just wait till you hear God tell you what you're going to be doing now. Now, let me just cast a vision for you, Father will say one day. I'm telling you. It's good that you're here tonight. It's good that we are here. It's good that we are here to be encouraged in, in the things of the Spirit. When Satan is trying to overwhelm the world with his chaos, with his darkness, with his lies, with his oppression, with his sin, with his iniquity. It's good that we hear to understand what's really going on. To lift up our eyes and behold and see that our redemption draws nigh. Hallelujah. That God's got things going to happen that we can't even begin to imagine. It's just so good. So back over here. And uh, somebody said, well, he went to teach. He went from teaching to preaching. No. 
Actually, there's no difference. Unless I was up here just shouting a bunch of nonsense. But I tell you right now, it, just shouting Jesus is preaching. So, um, go back to the previous one because you can see everything better. And let me just say, there are so many things in those charts that if you can put them in order in the context in which uh, Larkin has laid out for you um, and then understand them in that context. And, of course, you just stay in these meetings, just meetings or just in the future, these meetings in the future, just go back to the YouTubes and, and they will be able to, to and those YouTubes that I've already given, meetings we've already had, really pretty much puts all those images in, in context for you. So none of them is a mystery. You go, oh, I know what that image is. Oh, I know what that image is. Oh, yeah, I got it. And really, it won't be take you long. If you give yourself to this, you can, you, can, you can explain every symbol on all of those charts. And any symbol you can ex explain on those charts, then we want to help you to be able to explain them because we're not here just to give you some information. We're here to instruct you in the ways of, God, of life and here to teach you so you can go teach others also because that's what it's about, okay? We wanted you to be down the road when nobody's around but you and you've got a bunch of people sitting around saying what is it about the Lord you can take them from Genesis to Revelation 22 21 and be accurate rather than in the, in the, in the Chinese cultural revolution they got so messed up that by the time was, the cultural revolution was coming to a close they were calling the uh, Holy Ghost the dragon because nobody could really remember what they were supposed to be saying because somebody didn't get taught good enough right so we want you, no matter what's going to happen, behold, perilous days are upon you. I'm telling you, the earth is rumbling. The earth is rumbling with earthquakes on a level that has never been in, in, our, in our time. You can go and look at quake feed. Go look at, the, go look at the historical data. It's up at levels that it's never been before. It's a consistent in the realms of fours and fives. It used to be consistent 10 years ago in the realms of twos and threes. Volcanoes are going off all over the place. If you've got disaster alert, I have disaster alert and quake, and quake feed because I like to look at the condition of the earth. I know what's going on in the earth. The earth is going to reel to and fro. The earth is going to be in pains like a woman in travail about ready to go into birth. It's going to have, it's going to have contractions, in other words, that are going to get closer and closer together. I like to keep my finger on the dial about what's happening around the globe amen, amen. and 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 the and the earth is speaking a lot of different things people you in the midst of of, of great change you in the great you forget about all the other things you plan to do i'm telling you right now the only thing you want to plan to do is go to heaven I tell you, we're on the only the only good plans that are going to work out for you is the ones of meeting christ jesus in the air amen, amen. coming back with them to rule and reign for a thousand years but at any rate so what, what, we got, what I've got to try to do, wrap up and try to give you something on Re Revelation chapter 18 before we have to dismiss, because I could do this all night and just enjoy myself, maybe even at your expense, but I'll tell you right now. <laughs> I see anointing so strong on me, I feel like I'm about to vaporize. But at any rate, <laughs> hallelujah. And it's the only way to teach. It's the only way to minister. Then you don't have to do it out of your head. You can do what God said instead of out of your head. And, 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 and it's beautiful. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful way, way to minister. And we want to also teach God's people how, how skillful the Holy Ghost will make you. Now, obviously, somebody's going to have to sit down and go and start doing some study. And I'm so blessed for all of you. Uh, coming to finally realize, some of you, that you're supposed to read the Bible every day and what a prophet it is. <laughs> What a prophet it is when you do. And that it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. Satan's been lying and hindering. But might you get into these things and have, begin to have this a part of your relationship with the Lord. Ooh, it's good. And it just keeps getting better. So we've got to have to study. And we're going to have to, you know, um, be developed as workmen in the Word of God by the Holy Spirit and by the teachers that He's placed, you know, who in the church who aren't about their own success. They're not about their promoting their own ideas and coming up with some new novel concept of things, but are faithfully handling the Word and saying, this is what the Bible says. I'm not going to put it, my spin on it. I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm just going to walk you through what the Bible says. And then, of course, praise God, some people are going to go ahead and give themselves 
to understanding the ancient history and the historical events relative to these things that the Word of God is, 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 is telling us and, 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 and the various different time frames in which they happen. And that's what this is all about. Once again, this is Daniel sitting in Babylon and getting ready to tell us uh, and really setting us up so we can understand what spiritual Babylon is because this helps us primary the biggest revelation that helps us understand what mystery Babylon is in Re Revelation chapter 7 and help us understand what's, why, what's going on with literal Babylon of Re Revelation chapter 18. People want to come up with there's some novel ideas of God and gave them some revelation and that, you know, they come up with some, you know, new insight. Nonsense. God did that for Daniel, so we didn't have to go through all that. So that we could get it and go ahead. Somebody tried to tell me, he said, Oh, well, you just need to believe in the, in the, the church is going through the tribulation. I said, My goodness gracious. I figured that after this long a time, you would have gotten enough wisdom to realize from the reading of the Word of God that we're not going through the uh, tribulation, that we're being caught up. And because you can't get that established in your life, you, you're blind to the rest of so much other scripture that God would open your eyes up to. So you can go, I say, I'm so far out ahead of you, you can't, I'm not completely out of your sight now. You can't even hear me no more. And that's the truth. I'm a faint little. And the person had to, the people had the chance to keep up. But they chose not to keep up. They chose to go somewhere else. So once again, yeah. So once again here now, Daniel gives us this revelation. Then in the context of his crying out to God for Israel, and the Lord shows him by by a vision of seventy weeks, seven weeks, basically starting the the, the um, forty nine years. To rebuild the temple from the time that God had uh, shown Daniel what the starting point would be. Then 62 weeks from the rebuilding of the temple until the Messiah comes. Being a total of 69 weeks, Jesus came, died on the cross. Literally said, the cutting. He, he, he literally, the prophet said to the time that the Messiah is cut off, cutting off of the prince, Christ Jesus right here. And then we've been in this big, gigantic gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. And then the 70th week starts right here again when all the world's attention turns back to that little nation, Israel. And that's where all of a sudden you start reading Revelation chapter 6. And then what makes a big point here that I want to give, and, and uh, I want you to go to the first slide. I want to show you the first slide. And that is... Not only is those 70 weeks a very important time point that everybody need to understand if you're going to understand the future events, but this other very important peg in the ground that I said you got to have. And that, that this peg in the ground, this isn't a Larkin chart. If you're on Larkin website looking, this isn't a Larkin chart. I keep losing this thing. There we go. Right here, this is an important time point. See that one? It's the abomination of desolation. It all of a sudden, that time point brings together a lot of verses of Scripture uh, from Matthew and, and from Daniel so that we know specifically and perfectly where we are at so that we can then not only more perfectly relate the, 70, the events of the 70th week that Daniel spoke of, but also the various events within the framework of those 70, 70 weeks that Daniel describes so we can understand more perfectly how it unfolds, where the Antichrist comes from, what his rule and power is going to look like, what events are going to take place, what are the geographical locations, uh, etc. And, and, of course, you know, the desolation of abomination really speaks loudly of a geographical location because that's right in the heart of Jerusalem. Yeah. And, you know... I was ministering to you on Wednesday night, just trying to get into it. I didn't get into it much, but just beginning to lay out for you the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ will come and can come at any time. And He comes. You don't know when He's going to come. At noonday, in the morning, at night, you don't know where, when He's going to come. But always be ready. Have your, have your belt on. Have your light burning. So that when He comes, you're going to be ready to immediately go. 
And somebody said, well, you know, don't these prophecies have to be fulfilled? Well, the prophecies could be fulfilled the next day. God can, we can, we watched as, you know, Egypt and, and um, Libya and the radical changes that took place just in like two, three months. All of which the scripture has a lot to say about it. A lot of these things pointing very clearly to the last days that we live in. We saw... Uh, in, in these changes that have happened in the Middle East over the past 10 years, things that people would have thought maybe they were in the school of prophets and understood the scripture, and they would have thought, my, take 100 years for that to happen. No, it didn't happen. It didn't take 100 years to happen. In, in 10 years, more happened than could even be imagined. Then in, a, in one year, more happened than could even be imagined in this last year. And then six months more happened than can even be imagined. And all the world is looking at Syria on fire, Iran on fire, Iraq on fire. They, all the world's being troubled again about Turkey. And I'm not going to start talking about those nations and their impact again. You have to go back to the last... Um, YouTube from the last Revelation study, because if I do, I'm going to get off on that, and you know what's going to happen? I'm not going to be able to talk about things that I want to talk about. So, um, I just want to make, once again, I want to make a very important point to everybody that if you don't understand this key time period, the abomination that makes desolate, that is where the Antichrist comes in. Where does he come into? He doesn't come into America. Doesn't sit down in the church. He comes into Israel, into Jerusalem, and he sits down in the holies of holies, and he proclaims himself God, and he makes desolate a temple that is inhabited again. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There's no room. The ideology, philosophies that have emerged that somehow the tribulation is about the church. There's no room for it. Not in any prophecy that is given. There's no room for it. The church is caught away. It's when the marriage supper, while all this crazy nonsense, God's wrath being poured out upon the earth, all the crazy nonsense that's happening in the demonic realm is taking place. Well... There's a, a marriage supper celebration going on in heaven. We, we partying. We having a good time. We finally getting to get a concept about all what life really looks like. I mean, and the vision that ha Father is going to cast for us to where we say, we will compare this life now to like, my goodness, what a wet blanket. What a dud. I mean, we, we haven't even begun to live yet. And Father wants to help us understand that. And he spends so much time laboring for us to get it. And, and, he, and he tries to speak to us on very simple terms like love, joy, peace. He said, what do you like, love, joy, peace? Or do you want torment, fear, hate, and war? I mean, it's well, I'll take the love, joy, peace. And a lot of people say, oh, you know, a lot of people in various different cults and, you know, new age stuff, oh, I want love, joy, peace, but they can't have any because there's only one way to get into love, joy, peace. There has to be the prince of peace that destroys the powers of darkness that will always keep men from this realm. That's why Christ Jesus died at Calvary, to bring us into this wonderful glory. Now, I'm going to tell you this. You listen to me. I want you guys to go back and listen to this tape after I'm done tonight because I've laid out a lot of key points. What have I been going for about 45 minutes? I've laid out key points that are so, that is so essential for you to be able to understand the events that are going to be un, uh, begin to unfold and so that you don't get snared by the deceptions of Satan and by the strong influences of the society that is around you. The people that are in darkness that are around you, they have a voice, they have an influence. The prince of the power of the air has a voice, he has an influence. You're blessed to be here tonight so that you can look beyond all of that voice and all that influence and see what's really going on. So, so I just pray in Jesus' name that you really, truly just grab a hold of it and, and take it for the, for the blessing that it is for you to be able to, to hear these things and then come to learn them so you can teach others also. Go back to the next slide real quickly. Um, so I just want to say, uh, once again, uh, I, I, I've got to have some artists help me make this better because this is supposed to be a regal king showing all of the government's that will exist on the earth, the major governments that will exist on the earth from the time of Daniel all the way to the time that the, uh, that the seventh and the eighth kingdom rises. 
and the head of gold being the uh, king of Babylon, then uh, the, uh, ch the chest and, and shoulders uh, of silver being Medio Persia, and um, then the, uh, um, the, the next element being here, the brass, which represented uh, uh, Greece, and then, um, then the next uh, element here, the legs of iron, uh, representing the Roman Empire, the great kingdom of the Roman Empire, and then the final one, which, is, which we really see rising now. Uh, and we, we've seen the beginnings of it for quite some time, and it won't take. And it's not going to take long for it to ultimately kick in. But we're going to ultimately we would see the rise of this empire right here, which is uh, the element of clay and of iron, representing the seventh and the eighth kingdom, and the symbolism. Of course, I've already given it in three different meetings. I'm not going to go over it. Just wanted to highlight that. All in the context of the Babylonian Empire, remembering that this, that this whore of the spiritual Babylon whore, important, important, very important point for you, spiritual Babylon whore of Revelation chapter 17, she is drunk on the blood of saints, speaking of Israel, the blood of the saints that she's persecuted beginning in Egypt and ending with the seventh kingdom, which is yet to come. Egypt, Syria, uh, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, and the seventh one that is about to come. And that, that her religion and that whoredom is said over and again in the Word of God being the whoredom of idolatry, worshiping demons. Because that's what God calls idolatry, demon worship. Okay? That that is her religion. It's not any other ism. It's that ism. It's the, it's the idolatry-ism, demon-ism, the worship of demons. Now, I want to real quickly take you and um, show you in Revelation chapter 18 something very quickly. And I want to remind you that, uh, that, that the rebellion after the flood, the rebellion began in Babylon under the, under the rulership of Nimrod. And at the end, the very end, the rebellion will end in, in the same Babylon that Nimrod started, who started this idolatry worship that ultimately the whore represents. Understand that. He's the one who instituted demon worship through idols. Okay? And it will all end once again in Babylon. So what we see first in Romans chapter seven, in Revelation chapter 17, the spiritual Babylon. And I, I can't help to emphasize that enough because there's so many crazy things being said about that. And now literal Babylon, Revelation chapter 18. What happened to the lights on this side? Electrical short? Okay. Because I, I know it's kind of hard on the camera. But uh, is everybody there? Revelation chapter 18? Yeah. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was... Uh, lightened with his glory, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, the cage of every unclean and hateful bird, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And once again, you, you have to go all the way back to understand this. You've got to go all the way back to Nimrod. It's not just within the context of the final few years. It's that Babylon and Assyria and Medio Persia and the Grecian Empire and Rome has had that geographical location as the highlight of the earth in terms of the reign of this particular um, show of demon power and this particular influence that Satan has um, relegated over humanity that's ultimately going to be broken these last days when at the end of the, at the end of the seven year tribulation because we're right here at the end we're right coming to the end here now 
And so, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, and that ye be not partakers of her sin, and that ye receive not her plagues, for her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she has rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. And in the cup which she hath filled, fill it to her double. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she hath said in her heart, I sit as a queen, and I'm a no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death, mourning, and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judges her and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication. Once again, we're talking about the whoredom of idolatry. That's what the Lord refers to idolatry in from, uh, from the beginning all the way to the end. He refers to it as spiritual adultery or, or fornication. Live deliciously with her. She'll be well heard and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. So as, as King Nebuchadnezzar, who is the second primary type of Antichrist after Nimrod, he actually built a great image and commanded the whole world to fall down and worship the image. Well, that's exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. But Satan is going to be cast down out of heaven. He will be right in the big middle of it. An angel, an angelic power of darkness who has been bound in the pit because there's only, the only angels that are bound in the pit are the ones who left their first estate and sinned with mankind as I've described it to you over and again. Don't want to describe it again. They, he will come up out of the pit. He will also be empowering the Antichrist and the, the combination, if you would, of these powers of darkness at work will not only give the image the power to speak, but there will all be all kinds of signs and wonders being taking place uh, and uh, lying, lying wonders that will take place to de deceive the whole world. And where is it going to be happening from? Babylon. And this is, a, this is it's crazy to think of that um, 200 years ago, by and large, Babylon was completely off the radar, right? 150 years ago, Babylon was basically off the radar, right? About 100 years ago, it started coming on the radar, right? And, and then all of a sudden, with the discovery of oil and the use of fossil fuels, then it became a huge part of modern society. Are you with me? And the Babylonian kingdom, if we take Babylon not just as a city, not just as a city, but as a kingdom. Remember, these are all, God's representing these, these, uh, the, this image uh, on, on the basis of kingdoms, not cities. The kingdom of Babylon, look at it, and, and that's why I've given you maps and overlay maps so you can kind of see the effect how that Babylon also eclipses Assyria, Assyria, the kingdom of Assyria is involved in, 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 in that description. So we can't really limit it to, for example, modern-day Babylon uh, or uh, mo modern-day um, Iraq or modern-day um, uh, modern downtown uh, Baghdad. Are you with me? Because I think that that's sometimes what the image that people get. But ancient Babylon also included a part of Iran, modern-day Iran. It, it, in, it included um, even part of the Baltics. I'm pretty sure. Didn't it include part of the Baltics? The lower part, uh, just below the uh, Black Sea. Just below the, below the Black Sea. Out to Turkey, part of Turkey. Okay? And Egypt. So... What I want to point out to you is that as Nebuchadnezzar built an image, who the, and, and of course the story, we know this, this, the story of it is resounding to us because it's a story to three, three Hebrew children who was thrown in the fiery furnace and didn't burn. Why, did, why were they thrown in the fiery furnace? They were going to bow down and worship the image. What happens is the Antichrist is going to build an image 
And this is the transition from the seventh kingdom to the eighth kingdom, which I hope you've got enough understanding to know the transition now. If you don't, go back and, re go back and listen to the last study that we did about a month ago. Go back and listen to the last one. I don't remember what it's numbered, but it's just one just before this. Number six. Is this the only, this is the seventh one, huh? I might have to do two more. But at any rate, go back and listen to the sixth one so that you can understand a little bit more about this transition from seven to the eighth. And what we're looking here in Revelation chapter 18 is we're looking at the destruction of it. Now here's the eighth kingdom. It's existed. It's now deceived the whole world. Now it's not just an image that, that is an image of stone. It's now an image that actually has power to speak. Satan, Lucifer is right there involved in it. These powerful angels of darkness are involved in it. Angels are being seen by men. They're no longer hid from men during this time. There's an interaction going on between men and angels at this time. Pretty radical stuff. And during the midst of all of this, uh, Babylon is reaping the benefits of this oppression of men. Just like Nimrod was going and hunting men in Genesis chapter 11 and 12 and ultimately making slaves out of men and bringing all of their treasures unto himself and all of their riches unto himself. Well, that's exactly what's going to go on. Yeah, there's upheaval and chaos taking place everywhere, but the subversion of men is ultimately resulting continually in, the, in, in a prosperity of, of a sort and a riches of a sort that continually empowers this seventh and this eighth kingdom as they rise with, with, a, with a notion that they're going to ultimately overthrow God and rule the universe. Can you conceptualize that for just a minute? In the battle of Armageddon, Satan will lead with the Antichrist all of the armies of men and they will knowingly go out to fight against God. This is where humanism is taking us. This is where all this new rise of this new kind of hatred is taking us. God can't tell us what to do. If we want to be homosexuals, who, do my, who am I hurting? Am I, if we want to get drunk, if we want to be this, if we want to be that. Look, you know, we're not hurting anybody. You can't tell us what to do, you narrow-minded religious people. You can't tell us that we have to be this or to be that. I mean, it just ultimately goes to the point where they now are ready to go overthrow God. They're ready to destroy him. Are you hearing me? Okay, and that what takes place there in, in um, the valley of Megiddo and where blood flows from Lebanon to Bozrah, which you go, go in and uh, measure it on a map. It's 200 miles from Lebanon to Bozrah. And there's a, there's a, there's a perfect little place, little canyon there's canyons that all connect just fly it on google earth we got all this power to do these kinds of things now fly it on google earth and see where the blood's going to flow three to four foot deep for 200 miles people trying to kill god they I'm just you know trying to destroy god and it's in the midst of that time when the lord comes that that literal babylon the kingdom of babylon is going to be destroyed. Somebody said, well, why the kingdom of Babylon? Because it is there from which the Antichrist rules. We already know that he's called the Assyrian. We understand that every typology, everything about him, all of the prophecy that was ever given concerning him was always in the context of Babylon. It should be easy to pretty, pretty much easy to get this. But it has nothing to do with Islam. Other than the fact that Islam is based upon uh, the worship of a meteor that fell from heaven. Did you know that? It's a black rock. They want to say that, that they don't worship idols. They worship idols. They worship a meteor, a black rock. And I'm not going to give you the name of it because I'm going to take it up from my lips. They go into Mecca to worship a meteor that they've worshipped for well over, uh, well over 2,500 years. And all, all, all Muhammad did was because the tribes already, the, the tribes of the Middle East already gathered around this celebration that we, that's now called Ramadan. They already gathered, it, that one event gathered all the tribes. All he did was take the black rock, which is still there, the meteor that fell from heaven, which is an idol from which they 
ultimately communed with demon spirits. And he basically put, built it, Mohammedism, which some people call Islam, he built it around it. And he told everybody to go basically kill anybody who refused to come and worship the rock, which is Allah by name. So I said, Allah is the same as Jehovah or Elohim. It's not. Elohim's not a meteor that fell from heaven. Hello, he's not a black rock. But it's too bad if people don't know this. It's about too bad that CNN doesn't do their justice and say, well, this is how it all started, or our Fox News, or anybody of these other reporting groups go and say, well, look, this is really what we're dealing with here. This is the origin of it, because this is, this is public domain knowledge. Is, I'm not, you know, proclaiming some spin on the thing. I'm just telling you how it all went down. He says, therefore shall her plagues come on in one day, death, mourning, famine. She shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judged her. The kings of the earth who committed fornication live deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is the judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth her merchandise any more. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stone and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet. I mean, this is getting pretty literal, right? So we're not, we're not wondering if this is spiritual. The spiritual Babylon, spiritual mystery Babylon was revealed in Revelation chapter 7, 17. Now literal Babylon is being revealed now here in Revelation chapter 18. Uh, Thine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and of iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointment and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beast and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls and men and the fruits that thy soul lusteth after are departed from thee and all things which were dainty and goodly and have departed from thee and thou shalt find them no more. The merchants of these things which were rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster and all companies of ship and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw her smoke of her burning, saying, What city is this unto this? What city is like unto this great city? And, and, you know, somebody said, well, you're talking about cities, and yet you said Babylon represented a kingdom, and it does. And yet, within the framework of Babylon as a kingdom, there is the city Babylon, but it's an ancient city, right? It's a city that's not really on the radar today. It's the city that actually you could say that uh, Nebuchadnezzar built. And that, by the way, um, Saddam Hussein was devoted to rebuilding it. Why? Because he was under the influence of demon spirits. And because it's the, will of, it's the will of the powers of darkness. It is by no accident that Dubai, which sits out on the peninsula of ancient Babylon and the ancient wealth of, the, uh, of, the, of that great city Babylon that received so much of her wealth, uh, this, this place we now call Dubai was all a part of the structure of the, of the, of the wealth during the days of, of King Nebuchadnezzar. It's no wonder that now the world is trying to make Dubai the international banking system, a, a, a banking empire, and banking capital, capital, and where right now the ch the ch uh, Chinese government and the Indian government and, and and how they are trying to move forward in a new economy and a new um, really a new society and a new trade and they're they're look they're looking not to the West they're not looking to London. Uh, uh, you know, stock market, or they're not looking to the United States of America stock market. They're looking towards the Middle East. Why? They need the oil. And, they, and they're looking to the trade with the Middle East and the capital of business being Dubai. What is this? It's all a forerunner. It just shows you how quickly all of this could easily, e quickly and easily change. And every possible thing within the context of prophecy could begin to be, as it were, fulfilled overnight. So once again, have your belts on, your loins girded about you, and have your lights burning. Amen. And so, here we go. 
And uh, I, just, I, I really want to just finish reading this, if, if I can. And let's see, where am I at? Verse 17, 19. And they cast dust in their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, the great city. Boy, how many times have we got to say this? <laughs> I believe this is at least the fifth time. Alas, alas, oh my, the city, city of Babylon. We're getting, repetition should get the job done. Yeah. Alas, alas, the great city wherein were made rich all that, that had ships uh, the, uh, in the sea by reason of her uh, costliness or wealth. For in one hour she made desolate, rejoice over her, the he, uh, rejoice over her, heavens, and ye holy apostles, and ye prophets. For God hath avenged you on her. And so would you say, wait a minute, what, what are we talking about now? Clearly we're talking about the oppression that began really in the Assyrian Empire and more fully realized in the Babylonian Empire of how the Assyrians and the Babylonians oppressed God's people because of their disobedience. God allowed it only because of the disobedience because if they'd walked obedient before the Lord, they'd, they'd, no, nobody had been able to touch them. But so we, we can't just look at it within the framework of the seven years of tribulation that's going to go on, which once again, the focus is on not only the, 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 the sin and the iniquity of men, but the focus is on Israel as a nation because that once again, as I said over and again, it initiates the 70th week that Daniel saw in the 70 weeks of visions, the 70 weeks that were determined upon Israel as a nation, that showed all the highlight events, prophetic events, also in conjunction with the great image of that of, that represented the king, the great kingdoms of the earth. It would be from that same time in Babylon. All of these things are culminating in this moment in time. Okay. And all the judgment is that is upon them is right now finding its culmination here as well. The voice of harpers and musicians and pipers and trumpeters should be heard no more in thee. And the craftsmen of whosoever crafts should be found no more in thee. The sound of the millstones should be heard no more in thee. The light of the candles should shine no more in thee. The voice of the bridegroom and of the bride should be heard no more in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For the sorcerers were, and, and for by thy sorcery, sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now. I will say this in closing. A part of this can then only be fulfilled in the, in the last seven years. Daniel saw 70 weeks or 77s. The Lord broke it down into these prophetic windows of time. And the amazing thing about it is, is when we look back on prophecy... Prophecy that was given back 560, or was it 569 or 589? What was it? 569 years prior before, to Jesus coming. All of those weeks were fulfilled chronologically and sequentially. Everything that Daniel prophesied to the very detail where that you open up the Bible and you open up secular history and you look at it and you go, this is amazing. And that's why some people come along and say, ah, Daniel couldn't have been written before all these events because it's too perfect. He said everything that happened. No, it was written. And it's provable that it was written. And it was a perfect description of every event that would happen. And just like every event that happened in those first 69 weeks took place exactly like Daniel said, then the 70th week, which is the last week of sevens, which is every every day representing a year that last week of sevens that last week which represents seven years instead of seven days which represents seven years is going to go down with the same kind of accuracy that took place in the first 69 weeks or the first 69 seven and understanding the focal point being on Israel as a nation and what God would do to wrap things up with Israel as a nation and to bring Israel back unto himself in the midst of this tribulation. This is what it's all about. It's all about God pouring out his judgment on sin and iniquity. It's about sin and iniquity be, being fully unveiled. Satan 
in the middle of the, uh, of the seven years be, actually being cast down out of heaven, which is the unseen realm. It's the, it's the realm that you can't, you're not aware of right now. Your eyes would have to be open like the prophets of eye. Oh, their eyes were open and they could see that the heavens were full of the angels of the Lord, the horsemen thereof. That's the realm of heaven. He's cast out of the unseen realm. Men are able to see him. Men are able, men interact with angels and the demon power uh, that is existing right now in the kingdoms of men, but now exists even in a greater way so that the full iniquity without restraint is now revealed. Right now, Satan and his sin and his iniquity is restrained. We see certain things, manifestations of it. We see wars. People talk about holy, just wars. God wants us to go over there and kill them. That's nonsense. That's just nonsense. Okay? All that's designed by Satan. It's all designed by a satanic world. The financial system, the way that it runs, the way that society and governments oppress people. You don't believe it, but you're in a caste system. Somebody told you how much money you're going to make. And if you get a windfall, they're going to come knock on your door and find out how you got that. You know what I'm saying? If you make more money than what you're supposed to be making, it's just relegated to you by a system. Watch out. Hello. I mean, that's pretty much how it works. But now, all of a sudden, the veil is going to be taken off of it. It's not going to be limited anymore either. God withholds right now at that point. Satan has given power to overcome all the saints to destroy them. Right now, we have power over Satan. The church and the administration of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, having been given the Holy Ghost without measure, having been given the authority of Jesus Christ, has all authority over Satan to tread upon him, to, to, to overthrow him, to cast him out, to cast him down in every way. But during that time, Satan has power over the saints. Somebody says it's the same saints. No, it's different saints. Somebody says, what are you talking about? They're the saints of God in a different administration of time. they like the saints of the Old Testament. That's why when you read the book of Revelation, by the time you get to chapter 6, you're using all Old Testament terminology. Now, what I want to do, what I'm planning on doing in the next Revelation study, is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to jump in to the great culminating uh, event, the, 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 the greatest uh, exclamation mark in the Scripture. Greatest crescendo of the Word of God. And I'm going to minister to you on the most glorious and most wonderful subject of which I'll use Revelation chapter 19 as, uh, uh, as at least a springboard to do it, okay? Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody said to me, they said, well, when is the catching of the way, uh, catching away taking place? I had, a, I had some men of God, some older men of God come to me. And this, they said, uh, Pastor Mark, do you still believe in the catching away? I said, yeah. And they said, well, you're one of the few. Uh, could you remind me of why we're supposed to believe? I'm not kidding you. I'm not kidding you. Wonderful, anointed men of God. So in the midst of all the stuff that's going down, remind me. I'm telling you, I just began to flow out of me, just a river of it. And by the time I got done, they're shouting on the other side of the other end of the telephone. Yes, it's right. Yes, it's true. That is the word of God. You don't understand how dark things getting over here in Australia. You don't understand how dark things get over here in this other place and over in that other place. Where the, everybody's saying he's delayed his coming. He's not coming and catching away now. He delayed his coming and then come at the end of the tribulation. He delayed and delayed. He's not delayed. I can lay this thing out for you. And, of course, that's what I'm going to be talking about. As soon as I've done, let, you know, let the, uh, the info out. I'm going to talk about the catching away. I'm going to show you how all these things that I've talked to you now, seven meetings. I'm going to show you how they all come together and converge on the catching away and the provability, the the. the the overwhelming evidence that proves that he's going to come in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when men don't even expect it. We're going to be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He's going to come with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and we're going to be caught up in heaven to sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb and be inducted into the place that he has for us to rule and reign with him forever. 
and forever. The party's going to be going on in heaven while hell's going on on in earth. Huh? And everybody, everybody who wanted it, the ways of Satan, they wanted the ways of sin and iniquity. They wanted the lust of the flesh. They wanted the li lust of the eye. They wanted the pride of life. They wanted the things that all this earth is, is carried in, in the river of iniquity with. They're going to get their just dues. Because all sin, no matter how little it is, will result in men absolutely hating God, despising Him, and not desiring His rule. So don't allow any of it in your life. And the Lord, the Lord's here to empower us. And that's, you know, that I never believed that we would come, really come to a day where people would say that the doctrine of righteousness and holiness and sanctification are false doctrines. But behold, we are here. Behold, we are here. We hear that with the heart man believes unto righteousness. That let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. That he bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead in sin might live unto righteousness. Huh? Amen. Would be false doctrines. Lord Jesus. But it's just a sign of the day, the time. It's time for us to gather up. Just, just have, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm telling everybody that I know. Look, it's time to quit reading the commentaries of men and just start reading the Bible. Start at Genesis 1-1, read all the way through Revelation 22-21, then start back at Genesis 1-1. Go ahead and read through Revelation 22-21. I sat down this morning. In less than in 15 minutes, I read, I read, you know, 10 chapters of the Bible because I need to read 20 a day to be to done in 90 days. 15 minutes. And I'm like, come on, this is, just wait, what's going to happen to you? Once you get used to reading the Bible and it flows, you discover how easy it really is to cut the time in half and be able to bring it on down, you know, to 45, 60 days. When you can sit down and read, you know, 20 chapters, you know, in 30 to 45 minutes, and that's going through all the long list of the king's names, and you're trying, what was, <laughs> right? Does that hurt? That's... Well, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, living God. 